And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. Hi, I'm Steve from Royal Jewelers, royaljewelers.com, Royal Jewelers in Andover. Please reach out to us if you're ever looking for a new or certified pre-owned watch. We have the largest selection in New England. Today, you're watching an interview that I did with my friend Daniel. Hope you find it interesting. Hey, Steve. Thanks for having me over tonight. Always fun to hang out with you, Daniel. I agree. So, listen, you've been in the watch industry, selling watches, collecting watches for 40 plus years. I love talking watches with you. I want to hear about some of the strangest or weirdest things that you've been through in your, your history of buying and selling watches. Maybe some things that people might not know. Well, good point. I have been doing this full time for 45 plus years at Royal Jewelers. As you know, my dad started the company in 1948. And when I first came into the business, people were collecting pocket watches. Wrist watches were not popular to collect at that time and really didn't start happening until late 70s, uh, early 80s. And we were one of the pioneers of collecting wrist watches. Uh, but one of the, the oddest, strangest situations or experience that I can remember was the night that I got a call from Rick Sedler, who was then the publisher of the Rob Report magazine, asking me if we were interested in purchasing uh, and selling through the magazine the watch that President Kennedy was wearing the day he was assassinated. Correct me if I'm wrong, but that was a pretty popular magazine at the time. And if you wanted to know what was trending, that was where you went. So you're sort of talking pre-internet or pre-popularity of the internet. And that was the magazine that really showed everything exclusive, everything expensive, everything rare. And that was the go-to magazine for connoisseurs or those that were looking for the best of the best. So, so yes. Take me through what happened. What was what did that time frame, the phone call, what did you go through and, and what was your reaction to that? I think first you have to sort of maybe put in perspective the whole Kennedy assassination for me personally. So I was nine years old in school. Uh, Kennedy gets assassinated. He gets shot in the motorcade. And we get released from school that day and we go home. It was on a Friday. And so we all, all, everybody goes home from school. I'm sure everybody from that era knows exactly where they were when Kennedy was shot. And that entire weekend, uh, we were glued to the television set watching as all the incidents uh, and happenings unfold. As best you can recollect, I mean, take us back as, as much as you can. You're a kid, you're sitting in school, and all of a sudden you're being rushed out of the school, heading home. What was, what was going through your head, or what were you feeling at that time, if you can remember that? Um, I, it was sort of, it was fear, uh, and I guess disbelief. And not that I had a true understanding of politics, or certainly world politics at that time, but knew that he was a leader of, a country, of our country, and was sort of a great hope uh, during that period of time. So it was, um, it, it was a shock. Uh, it was deafening, if you will, and as I say, watching on black and white TV, of course, watching everything unfold over the weekend to the point of watching Lee Harvey Oswald leaving the police station to go to the courthouse and getting shot live on TV by Jack Ruby. And that is an image that is so indulged in my, my mind, my brain, and, and when I got this phone call, that was sort of one of the first things that popped into my head was that, that, that distorted face of... Uh, of Lee Harvey Oswald as he's getting shot right in, in the stomach. And so the whole Kennedy mystique, the whole Kennedy error from Camelot right to, to, to his death, and then all the conspiracy theories, et cetera, beyond that, um, being offered that watch, I, I was stunned for a moment and, um, and, and really didn't know how to answer Rick and said, just give me a second and there was a pause. And again, the flashback of me at nine years old in front of the black and white TV, watching all this happening and the case on of Kennedy in the casket, uh, writing. I'm sure all those center. memories go through in just a matter of seconds. Uh, yeah, like a flash. Um, and then my first response was, well, what is the watch? Who owns the watch? Tell me more. So once you ask that question, I'm sure there's a hundred things going through your head, but what did you find out? Were you able to acquire the watch and, and Tell me some of the details. So the first thing I want to know, of course, is what is the watch? And he tells me it's a Cartier watch. And the second thing that I want to know is who owns it? 
because provenance is going to be very important in a situation like this. And then I have to start thinking in my head after uh, thinking of the gravity of the situation of the day he was wearing it, do we even want to possess this watch or be involved in any capacity? I can imagine there was probably some risk there in the back of your head as do you want to be associated with that type of event, whether, you know, you can look at it in many different lights, but that could have, I'm sure that at the time that was probably a little nerve wracking. That was heavy. So um, what I did was I said to Rick, let me think about this a little bit. Let me call you back. And then the first thing I did, and being a history buff, I had a, I had a copy of the Warren Report and I hunted for that in our house because, again, we're talking really pre-internet. And what I did, uh, so it wasn't like you could look up and have all this information at your fingertips. So I pulled out my Warren report and started looking through where I might find some reference to the watch because he was wearing it that day. Um, difficult to find, but I did find a reference to it. So then I called Rick back the next day and started asking about who owned the watch. And oddly enough, um, it was owned by a collector of Kennedy memorabilia, a young man in his teens named Robert White. Uh, was watching a television program on Lassie, which is, I don't know if it's a show that you would remember or even have heard of. Yep. And uh, it happened to be about uh, collecting signatures. So Robert White wrote to President Kennedy asking him for his signature. And Evelyn Lincoln, who was Kennedy's secretary, sent him back a, an autograph of, uh, of President Kennedy. And that's what began his fascination And shortly after Kennedy was assassinated. And Lincoln and White... Uh, continued a friendship through many, many years. Kind of weird that President Kennedy took office in 1960, President Lincoln took office in 1860, and that Kennedy's secretary happened to be named Lincoln. <laughs> Just a little sidebar oddity. Um, so she, they stayed in touch, and she, through the years, uh, gave him different Kennedy memorabilia. When Kennedy was shot, Mrs. Kennedy really didn't want to have anything to do with any of the artifacts in the Oval Office. And President Johnson was moving in within a matter of days to the Oval Office. And it was Evelyn Lincoln's responsibility to clean out the Oval Office and a lot of the artifacts that were, uh, that were President Kennedy's. So she had not hundreds, but thousands of artifacts that she ended up giving to Robert White. So the story of the watch was, um, it, was on his, it was on his hand. And when I went back and looked at uh, the Zapruder film and some of those other films that are, that are relatively famous, uh, doc, not films that were Hollywood films, but films of the actual day, when he was shot, he just prior to getting shot, he took his hand and he was pushing his hair back as it was windblown. So seconds before he's, he had shot, he, his hand with the watch is going across his, his hairline. So I'm thinking, this is a little too creepy. Don't really want to get involved in it. The watch was taken off his wrist by a nurse at the hospital at Parkland Memorial and put in her pocket. She later gave it to a Secret Service agent who later gave it to Mrs. Kennedy. And Jackie Kennedy gave it to her brother-in-law, Robert Kennedy. He went and had it cleaned and then gave it back to her. She didn't want to take possession of it. And as she was leaving the White House just days after the assassination, moving out because, so actually before the end of the year, we're talking November 1963, uh, by, you know, by the end of December of 63, she's moving out, and she gave the watch to Evelyn Lincoln. Evelyn Lincoln eventually gave it to Robert White. Robert White, in turn, sold the watch. When I spoke with Rick the next day, what he explained to me was that Robert White was in possession of the watch. And my fear was is that the Kennedy children, probably either John Jr. or Caroline, may want that watch back. So I didn't want to get in the middle of a, uh, of a legal tangle, but more importantly, just thinking of that day and what it meant to me and how history changed that day, how the world changed that day, I didn't want to be in possession of that watch. Did that come up in conversation about selling the watch, about the children or grandchildren, and did that play a factor? Um, it did in, with, with the Rob Report or... With being able to sell the watch, the, the deciding whether or not to sell the watch. I don't, it didn't really go that deep. I, I knew early on that this wasn't something that I really wanted to be involved with. It just it was a dark period of American history, dark period for the world. And I, didn't, I just thought I really didn't want to have possession. So you never ended up selling the watch. Never ended up selling the watch. Pretty interesting story, though. An odd one. Yeah, yes. for sure. I'm sure that was a game changer for you back in that, back in that time frame, for sure. Absolutely was. Awesome. Thanks for sharing. Well, thank you for sharing. That's a great story, and it's something that a lot of people probably don't think about. And I think it's a, it's a great piece of history. It's a great piece of the Royal Jewelers' history. And yes, you know, 
could have been that close to actually selling a, a major piece of history, but I understand the, uh, your stance on it and I understand not wanting to you know, go down that rabbit hole and, and digging up all those old memories and being associated with such an epic event in time. No question. And again, it's, it stands, stands prominent in many people's minds and everybody's still wondering really who shot President Kennedy. Yep, I agree. Daniel, I have a lot more of these stories to share with you. I think we should open up a bottle of scotch and I'll share a few more. I'd love to have some scotch and I'd love to hear some stories. Sounds like a good plan. Let's go. Stay tuned. <laughs>